Welcome everybody to our stream of Zero for the Digital Tabletop Fest hosted by Steam. We are so happy to be part of this wonderful celebration of how tabletop or analog games are spreading their love through a digital format. And we couldn't have a better game to play today to share that love with you because Zero is one of the most approachable, beautiful, fun games around. And as you will see, the tabletop version is, the digital tabletop version is top notch. We, my name is Suzanne Sheldon, and you may know me through uh, being a member of the Dice Tower Network. I am one of the four co-hosts of the Dice Tower podcast and do some live streaming and digital plays. I've been talking about digital tabletop apps for actually seven years now. And I am so pleased and honored to have a few amazing people with me to play against today. Fingers crossed, I think I'm the underdog here. But let's start off with uh, Ray. Let's start off with you. Sure. Hi, Ray. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. <laughs> and Ray, can you tell everybody what you do with Calliope? As much as possible without getting yelled at. <laughs> no, I, I'm actually the owner and president of Calliope Games. And uh, um, I do just about, I'm, I'm the master orchestrator. How's that? Um, I don't actually design anything. But I actually put all the pieces together and get them out the door, get the games out the door. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the most challenging thing that I have from day to day is just making sure that uh, the games are actually getting in the right hands and people playing. So and that's why we're here, right? to show the game. Awesome. And we also have Chris Leader from Calliope Games. Say hi, Chris. Hi, how are you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. I am the director of fun at Best Calliope title Games. Ever. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm a game designer. I'm the director of fun at Calliope Games. Uh, I like to make goofy videos for gaming, and basically, I just uh, really, really enjoy the games that we make at Calliope. Um, gateway filler games, and so being able to help develop those things and get them in the hands of players uh, is a dream come true for me. That's awesome. And finally really one of the main reasons we're even able to be able to play this way today we have dan taylor from thunderbox entertainment hi dan hey hi everybody uh yeah that's right i'm dan taylor from thunderbox entertainment i'm the design director here i say design director but well, i don't really direct and i guess it's just me we're a very small boutique studio uh, and we have made it our aim to search out the finest board games in the land and take them off the tabletop uh, into the digital realm and you do a fabulous job. Uh, in fact, you're going to make me blush, just... Suzanne. Pardon? You're going to make me blush, Suzanne. Oh, well, hey, you know, I've got a lot of experience <laughs> in this stuff. And, I mean, after all, Thoreau is just one of the board games that you've managed to bring into the digital world over the last few years. But mm -hmm. I am, and, and we'll have to talk about the Thoreau sequels one of these days as well. Because so you've got a lot of people been asking us about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. We get a, a couple of emails every week about Sir of the Seas. Evil grin here. So <laughs> let's get started. I mean, we'll just chat. Let's play a game while we chat. You know what I'm saying? Of We've course. got yeah. a four player game set up here. And one of the things that you're not seeing is the variable player pawns. So if you've got a copy of Sero at home, or if you've seen a copy of the physical game, you'll know it's gorgeous. And it has these really delightful player pawns in a wide variety of colors, but they're kind of sophisticated. And one of the great things about digital apps is that you can play around with details like that. So we are going to play in rainbow mode, which brings a little bit of extra pop of color. But if you don't if you have the physical game, you're like, wait a minute, I don't have pawns that look like that. That's because, hey, we're playing digital mode today. And let's see, I will be playing the purple pawn. It looks like, Dan, are you the green? I am the lime green pawn, Suzanne. Okay, and Ray, you are... <laughs> I'm the <not> winning. <laughs> and we've got red there. That must be you, Chris. Ray was very Moving upset that red. I was... Ray was very <laughs> upset that I was the blue pawn in the last game. Excellent, yeah. excellent. <laughs> And, you know, I think that the great thing, one of the many great things about Sarah is that the rules are really, really simple. We're going to be playing tiles that have paths, and we'll be following those paths. And the last player standing is typically the winner. If we bump into each other, 
that's game over for those individuals. And uh, that's really the whole game. Lay a tile, follow the path, and we'll see how it goes. So why don't we get going with this? And um, guys, if you don't mind, I'm going to be pestering you with some questions. Yeah, do it, do, do it. it. All right. So let's, Ray, I mean, let's start off with you. Uh, Calliope has produced, I mean, how many games does Calliope have out right now? Um, that's not fair. Um, <laughs> I, I would say uh, I'll probably 15 or 16 at this point. I mean, that's yes. great. And part of that was, I know that you had the Titan series, which has produced a lot of really fun kind of what we would call gateway games, including Rob Davio's Ship Shape, which was the winner of the 2020 American Tabletop Awards Casual wow. Game of the Year recently. Yes. Yeah, and I didn't know that. Congratulations, you guys. Rob Davio's Ship Shape is a fantastic game. It, I, and personally, it's it's a personal favorite of mine, except there's a lot of yelling when we play because we get very, <laughs> very into it. But tell us a little bit about that Titan series. What was your goal with that? Uh, so, um, that's, it's really interesting because gamers um, as a whole, um, when they want to bring people into um, it's their hobby, right? They want to bring people in and play games at a level that um, they are currently at, right? And so a lot of newer players at that point then become intimidated by the different styles of games. Okay, so what we wanted to do with the Titan series was to create a um, a gateway game series for gamers to actually um, take advantage and play games that were designed by their favorite designers to introduce their friends into their hobby, right? So with the Titan series, we basically, if they're all quality style games, meaning they all have three to five rules, they all played with you know, 15 to 20 minutes, and they all play one to six players, sometimes up to eight and 12 players. I've mine plays 12, and um, they're all by really well known uh, designers like Rob Davio and uh, um, Mike Elliott. We have, we have Richard, Richard Garfield. Duffy. Yeah, I mean, the, the list is, is spectacular, right? Well, and, and I can add, let me add to that too that the designers, a lot of times designers can get pigeonholed a little bit. I mean, Rob talks about how he was doing legacy games quite a bit and he was looking forward to, you know, doing something new, being able to do Ship Shape or for Richard Garfield being able to publish Hive Mind with us, you know, when he's known for Magic and King of Tokyo. It allows designers to flex a different muscle, and that can be really exciting to a designer, whether it's being given a challenge uh, to design something outside of your comfort zone or, you know, dusting off a design that maybe you started, but you were like, I don't think anyone's ever going to want to publish this game by me. Um, it's a pretty exciting thing to be able to, to work outside your comfort level like that. So I, I, the, the, the Titan series did a great job with that. Now, it's, so, it's so much fun. The, the series itself. Yeah, and, and how many games are in that series? So there's currently nine. We're working on the last three. Um, so when it's all done, it'll be 12. Um, the, uh, the We had to combine um, two designers which uh, into one game, right? Uh, we just weren't able to, to uh, make the individual games gel. And so we had the, the great opportunity of working with Matt Forbeck and Mike Selinker. And they're both... Um, working on a, a single game, uh, which is going to be a, a role-playing style game uh, that was um, that is being uh, written around um, Monster Games, uh, was done by Matt Forbeck. So we're really excited about that. Can't wait to get, a, get that out, on the, uh, out in front of everybody. But that's going to be a little over a year down the road before you actually see something. So you, hear, you heard it here first. I probably shouldn't have said anything, but I did, so... Hey. <laughs> Steam exclusive. Yes, that's right. Spoiler alert here on Steam. Love it. I mean, we got to celebrate our digital tabletop fest and, and announcements are a great way to do that. So, Chris, listening to you talk, I mean, it's pretty clear that you are, along with your role of director of fun, you sound like you're speaking from a game designer's point of view as well. And I know 
that you've been nominated for an award for your work on the Back to the Future game, which is so cool. And, you know, working with a licensed IP, especially for something like Back to the Future, which is just so popular around the world. Was that a, was that a movie series that you enjoyed too? And <laughs> how is it different working on a game for a property that exists versus just designing a game like Roll For It, which just kind of didn't have any ties directly to a specific setting you had to use. Oh, I've got some thoughts here, but before I say anything, I want to go ahead and pull this move off <laughs> it's and get tight. Ray out of the game. Oh, oh no! Ray. Oh, no, no, you did <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, sweet, sweet, sweet payback. Um, Don't forget your elimination bonus. I, I, yes, yeah, so swap my tiles, then tap the deck to proceed. So I have swapped and taken. So here's the thing. Um, my wonderful boss, Ray, who I just eliminated from this game and who I'm sure is going to dock my pay for it. Um, <laughs> Ray is, so the thing about Calliope is we do have a specific set of criteria for the games that we publish. Um, we want to accommodate a bigger group. We want to make sure the games are fast and don't have that many rules. Um, and Ray has been wonderful over the years, uh, understanding that as a game designer, some of my designs aren't going to be right for Calliope games. I got my start with Calliope through Roll For It, which was a Calliope game, but there's many designs I do that are two to four players. And we don't typically publish any games that are two to four players. So Ray's always been really good about letting me kind of, you know, stretch out and, and work with other publishers to get my designs out there. The other thing Ray knows about me is that I'm a huge Back to the Future fan. I, I am a nut when it comes to Back to the Future. I've got the movies memorized. I have a working flux capacitor that's signed by Christopher Lloyd. I have... And by working, you mean you can I actually mean, time travel. I'm actually travel. from the future. I'm back yeah. here talking to you. Is what I mean. Um, I hook it up to my bicycle and I ride it up to 88 miles per hour. But Chris, you're um, getting a little close to me here. What's going on? No, oh, no, Dan, that's you. Me. Green. Watch yes. out, Dan. I'd love yeah. it. I'm going to be over here in this corner while you guys just do that. Yeah, yeah it's it's dangerous. I want to let side of the ball. But yeah, with Back to the Future, uh, Dice Through Time, Ravensburger, uh, I worked with Mike Mulvihill on one of the Titan series games, actually. He did Everyone Loves a Parade for us. And so I got to know Mike, and he's just a wonderful guy. And uh, he um, works for Ravensburger, uh, and he had reached out to me well before this and said, you know, if ever there's a game that's right for you, would you ever think about doing this? And I said, well, you know, I have to make sure it's okay with Ray, but sure. Um, and he reached out to me about this idea that they wanted to make a Back to the Future game. And he said, would you be interested in pitching? this and he solicited this to a lot of different designers and what I came to understand later was multiple people said to him have you asked Chris Leader <laughs> because they knew I was they such a crazy back to the future fan that this would be my dream come true so um, oh. yeah and so we uh, uh, me and my friends Kevin Rogers and Ken Franklin who um, Ken did the Mansky caper for us for Calliope um, he's also the voice of the Admiral in the Captain is Dead there, you see, it's a small world, right? Available like, on Steam soon. I'll come over here and be part of this party. I felt I felt all by myself. Um, so we worked on the Back to the Future game together. And uh, Back to the Future Dice Your Time came out this past summer. And it was um, everything I could have hoped it would be. I mean, we made a, a cooperative game. It was uh, just everything I love about the trilogy we put into uh, that game. And so I'm really proud of it. And I feel uh, incredibly blessed to have been able to uh, make my dream game. And that was my brass ring IP to work with. And to be able to do it was just incredible. Okay, I'm in a little trouble here, I think. I, yeah, I, Chris, you pulled it really nice. Yikes. This is, this is not good. Well, you're giving all your back to the future. Sorry. Quietly this supposed to be... murder everyone. Was this friendly mode? I, I thought we were uh. playing for Kelsey's. <laughs> <laughs> there um, you go. But I am, after all, a zero professional, so well, I'll see, make it through. Oh, right, yeah. Bruce, Dan. You managed to, to escape nicely. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's in a great position right now. Yes. And one of the things I love about the Suro digital implementation is the light streams. And the game, this is very much, you know, Dan, I think one of your approaches for your games often is if if you look at the digital version and you look at the physical version, you see how they're connected. And not all developers take that approach with their app of a physical board game. But one feature you can do in digital form that you can't do in a physical form are these light trails 
that are really gratifying to see uh, and help track your progress. And they're really delightful to see that kind of spaghetti. <laughs> so, Dan, how did you get started in this? Have you been a board? It's such a niche thing. Like, why? Yeah. Yeah, Why so, making board games digital? So I've, I've been making video games for over 20 years now. Um, and one of the hardest things to do when you're making a video game is to, to find the fun of the game and find something that's got like a, a really cool mechanic that's going to hook players, that's going to make your game pop out from the rest of the audience. And there are so many phenomenal board games out there have already got this hook, they've already found this amazing fun. I thought, well, why don't I just take those and kind of become like a, an ambassador for these great games and digitize them so they can reach an even broader audience. And that's kind of what prompted me to start Thunderbox, I think, what, six or seven years ago now, maybe, you know, yeah, about that. And uh, Sura was our first game and um, yeah, I'm, I'm secretly pleased for it. Incidentally, the, the little life trails, that are in, in Suro, they are based on a photo somebody took and posted on Board Game Geek with uh, bits of wool behind their, uh, oh, behind nice. their stones. And I saw it yarn, and I thought, as well, we that's say uh, in the yarn, yarn for, for people on the other side of the ocean. Um, but uh, yeah, I just saw it and thought, oh yeah, that'll look good in the video game. <laughs> so yeah, thanks whoever you are that did that photo. Well, that's quite clever. Wow, nice. I've never played that way. I might have to pull out some yarn and snip some links <laughs> to try my next physical game of Soro. That would be a lot of fun. Um, so, Ray, just jumping back to you. Now, yeah. you haven't been in board games for your entire career, right? I mean, Calliope hasn't existed quite that long yet. Hell. You, you, were, you had an art gallery before this? Yeah, I actually owned a, a lighting company, an art gallery, then we went to WizKids, you know, so... Um, I, I, uh, when I was at the art gallery, when I had the art gallery, um, I was, uh, approached by my brother-in-law who was, who is Jordan Weissman, right? And at the time he was the creative director for the Xbox and nobody even knew what the Xbox was, uh, cause it hadn't been released yet and it was still all top secret stuff. And, um, he had come up with the idea of the combat dial for playing miniatures games. And we were in Las Vegas uh, during his birthday. And um, the thing about the art industry is that um, nobody buys art because they have to, right? People buy art because they love it. And they really, really would like to have something adorning their walls or, or the counter space. And so, um, we were very blessed in that the art that we were selling was all very high-end artwork, um, but uh, it was very high highs and very low lows, right? Sure. And, um, and I drove my wife absolutely nuts, right? So <laughs> um, when we were talking with Jordan, he said, well, I have this great idea for uh, miniature games. And he said, um, I want to I want to do something with it, but I don't have a sales guy. Would you be the sales guy? I said sure. So uh, for a good year and a half, um, I worked out uh, right down the street. The, the Wiz Kids office that we opened up was actually um, across the parking lot from where my art gallery was at, right? And so I would go back and forth between the two, and. Uh, we started Whisket. So Jordan actually pulled me in <laughs> with my wife's blessing, right? And uh, and that's how I got into gaming, right? And so uh, he always tells me, he says, well, you're the one that wanted to get into this stuff. <laughs> so I, I actually love it. You know, being at Whisket, I, I, I came to realize that um, what I didn't know was that Gaming is to a lot of different people way more than just a form of entertainment. And when you find how it really touches people, um, it, it, it gave me goosebumps, right? And so um, being able to help kids who have learning difficulties, bringing families together and all that kind of stuff, I just, it just really, really uh, put me over the top. And so when we, 
started up Calliope, one of my major, um, what I really wanted to do was put people around the oh. table. Bye bye, Suzanne. Yeah, I couldn't uh, make it work. I tried, I tried. Yeah, you were kind of stuffed. <laughs> All I've got to do now, though, is just stay on the board longer than Chris. I know. Well, the board's getting quite tight. And and one of the features, Dave, that I really like on this is that when you can preview a tile, you can kind of see the paths. For people that have spatial reasoning challenges, sometimes games like this can be a little harder for them to play, but the app version really helps that along and lets you kind of see how tile orientation will impact your, your move. And it's a feature of the app I quite enjoy. That, that was a suggestion from one of our users after we launched. They said, you know what, you should do this. It would make the game a lot easier to play. And I was like, well, yeah, thanks. Well, and that's one of the great things about this is um, when you're playing the physical game, you can take the tile and kind of hover it out there and kind of turn it and see. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it could be really difficult in an app or in a game, uh, you know, digital game to accomplish that. And so I thought that was just a brilliant solution uh, to being able to kind of, you know, simulate what you would do in real life when you were playing. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, in my games, sir, I remember like picking up a tile and you're kind of squinting and twisting it and contorting yourself to preview the path. And inevitably you make a mistake and end up <laughs> off the board. But that's, that's how it goes. Uh, so, Ray, as, as kind of in your role, selecting what Calliope is going to do is part of that. And I know that. <laughs> There with I, I feel like board games and analog games have grown in popularity over the last couple of years and gotten a little more known. Oh, I see this. Oh this one. I I, I what, I'm gonna start a rematch very quickly. One moment. Yeah. Alright, do the rematch. We'll play again. You guys can all gun for me. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll do we'll play a different game mode. We can do uh, loop. We can compete to see who gets the most loops. With the growing popularity of analog games over the last couple of years, I've noticed that there are a lot of people who want to design games. They're inspired by all of these wonderful games that they're discovering, and as people that are new to the industry or trying to figure out how to break in, they're looking for advice from designers and from publishers. So. Because Calliope is in that kind of sweet spot for games that are approachable and really accessible, what what are you looking for? What advice or what information are you looking for from game designers for Calliope? Sure. So before I jump into that, I, I'd like to make one uh, recommendation to designers, right? Which would be uh, before they actually go out and, and pitch a game to a publisher, that they understand where their game would fit into the catalog, where, where they would fit into the offer. So I think that's really, really important um, in order for, um, in order for uh, the designer to be successful within that, that different, you know, within the publishers themselves, because they may be wasting their time if they're, if they're showing a game that that publisher has nowhere in their in their lineup for them. So that that's the first thing I would say is you know know the publisher and know where you fit in with that publisher, right? Now for Calliope, um, you know we there are very specific things that we're looking for because we know what we really want to do and that is to bring new players into our hobby, right? And so um, with them in mind always, we understand that you know they anybody can hold on to three rules they under you know one rule is no problem two rules three rules that all good they get to that fourth rule they start getting a little shaky the fifth rule that's when their eyes roll up at their head right so for us um the number of rules that are actually in the game is really really important and if we're going to have more than that three or four rules we need to know that there's a hook there that the player um can actually grab onto the naturally get to the, the rule itself. And so that's the, the one of the very first things that we're looking at. Um, Ray, do you see how Dan gave himself a self-looping tile? He did. I, I did. Yes, I, I did that. I, I, actually, I, actually, huh. I was looking at the code while you guys were talking. I looked at the code. He did <laughs> that uh, himself. Uh, he, he actually hard, he, he wrote that into the code. 
Full scale. Full scale. <laughs> You'll notice he'll have a lot of those little loops on the edge of his tiles. Mm-hmm. Yep. Anyway, Ray, you were saying. Yeah, so, no, and uh, so, you know, the number of rules is really important for us. But also, fitting into that, that consumer's lifestyle is really important for us. So, uh, knowing that um, we can entertain from two to six players, that we can play within that 40 to 50 minute time slot, right? And that the games are all, when they're done, $40 or less, right? We prefer to be. Um, at that um, $30 price point, you know, or, or under. Uh, the last thing that I think that really separates us from a lot of different publishers out there is that we really focus on the, the players and the age of the players. So all of our games are actually intended for adults, right? But we are, uh, we want all of our games to be actually playable by children as young as they and in a way that they can play and compete without the adult throwing the game. And so our games are not games for kids, but kids can actually play and compete. And I think that that's really important. Uh, and so as want- a mother to two young children, I can attest to that. I've been playing Rule For It with my son since he was five, I think. Uh, oh. and, yeah. and he is perfectly capable of winning that game on his own without any help from me. So well, I'll say I Ray, said, definitely Ray has said something Ray's always said a very substantial thing that always stuck with me. He said that with most games for, you know, the kids are going to play, the adult has to step down into the world of the kids game. But with our games, we're asking for a child to step up into the grown-ups world to try and play the game. And most times, because of the way our games are, are built, the kids are able to do that and actually enjoy themselves and then no one has to come to the table feeling like oh i gotta play that game again so we really want to make sure that it's an enjoyable experience for everyone where they're playing on a a pretty you know even playing field and that's why a lot of our games will have some sort of a luck uh, you know a bit of luck to it um there's there's luck mitigation but there's also something that allows whether it's dice or something something that that evens the playing field a little bit for people yeah, that's one of the things I particularly like about Zero as well, because there's a lot of strategy and skill in it. But there's there's enough luck in terms of the way that the tiles will play out that like a, a young novice can beat somebody who's quite skilled and experienced in the game. Uh, but you still don't feel like the luck is working against you. So, yeah, and and if you're a programmer example. developing the app, you can ensure you always get the self tiles. Right, title. let's see. Let's see how that works. <laughs> so, look at that. I got another one of the new tiles. Oh, look at this. Look at this. So, Chris, I mean, hearing you speak about that, then from your perspective as a game designer, whether you're designing for Calliope, when you, whether you're starting for a licensed game like Back to the Future, how do you start on a game design? What are what are you thinking through? I get asked a lot if when I design a game, does it start with the theme or does it start with a game mechanism? And I have the, the answer changes um, for me um, depending on what I'm doing. So there are some times where I'm like, I really want to make a game based on, I mean, like, you know, Back to the Future, it was obviously the theme came first. Um, but for some games, I have I want to do something new or different with something like deck building or rolling dice or whatever it might be. And so I'll design around that and then come up with something. And usually as I'm designing that thing, themes will pop up into my head. But uh, it can be really liberating to make something that works um, that's totally vanilla, you know, has no theme to it whatsoever but that you can imagine some amazing themes for it. So um, I just go with whatever the inspiration is, whether I want to make a game based on some theme or whether I want to make a you know game based on mechanism. To that point, right, we've actually come up with themes for games and, and the mechanics in advance, right? It's like, oh, we want to make a thing. We want to make a game like this. And we've gone and, and changed it completely yeah. uh, from yeah. one thing to a different, right? Because uh, what we started out with um, was a really good idea, right? Uh, but it became a better idea when we did yeah. it under a different Well, I mean, you think about Soro Phoenix Rising, um, it was just, it was Crossroads. It had no real theme to it. It was just, it had these really cool uh, different Soro tiles. And, and it was in playing 
that the idea that the those the tiles in there have a side that actually is, is diagonal. So they go out on the corners, the paths. You see all of these tiles here only go out to the sides. Well, those have ones that go out to the corners. It was a much more freewheeling feeling. And so as we played it, we thought, well, you're like a bird. You're like flying. And then we realized that, I mean, you look at underneath the tiles we're placing right here on this board, there's a phoenix. And we realized we could be honoring the legacy of Suro by actually making it a phoenix game. And, and it just fits so perfectly. So that, that, that game from actually playing the game before it ever had a theme. All right. So I don't know if I'm going to hit many loops here. It's getting a little snug but uh <laughs> and, and he, with, with dan rigging rigging the situation here we'll see how this goes yeah, it's, but it's, it's, it's a little bit of luck and lots of skill what can i say uh-huh. <laughs> so, so bear in mind to be fair i must play about 30 games of zero every day working on this i i bet so. i believe it so how did the app how did this app that we're playing now come together how did how did thunderbox and Calliope say, we're going to make this happen. Uh, okay, so this, this happened probably probably about eight years ago. Uh, and I, I got the idea to, to do board games. Uh, and uh, Sura was my favourite, obviously. I thought, yeah, I can see how this would make a super cool app and like a digital version. Uh, so I made like a little demo with like half the tiles. And it was only one player and you can make a part. Uh, and it had the opening the box and everything. Uh, and I said, "Okay, we need to we need to get this over to the guys at Calliope. Like, who who is it?" And uh, Jules went, "Oh yeah, um, Jordan Wiseman. He's a friend of a friend. Why don't you send it to him on LinkedIn?" I'm like, oh, "Okay." So I sent this demo to Jordan by a friend friend on LinkedIn, uh, and I didn't hear anything back. So about six months later, I was like, "No, I, well, clearly they're not interested." I'm going to have to come up with a, another plan. I'll just ping them quickly, just to double check. So I ping them. And uh, Jordan got back to me right away. He was like, I'm so sorry. I completely forgot about this because I was really, really busy. Let me have a look at it right now. He had a look at it. Damn, this is amazing. I want you to get on a meeting with Ray, uh, have a chat, and we'll, we'll take it from there. And well, we got on super well. I think we got on quite well on our first meeting yeah. with Ray. Uh, he seemed like a nice chap. I don't know. Um, so we, kind of we, we end up making the app, uh, and then we went on to do Roll for It as well, which was also super fun on mobile. Uh, yeah, and uh, that, that was it. Really, just made made a demo and got it in front of the right people. And so, it, you know, for for us on, on our point of view, right, it was that it represented the board game, which was really really important because you know there's a lot of apps out there that they're that they're, they are board games, right? But they don't represent the game itself in its entirety. It's, you know, we're here. You're opening up the box. All the pieces come out in front of you. You know, so that is really, really important to how we're doing this. And the other thing that was really uh, that we really liked about this, and and even with Rolford, it's, it's it even comes through a little bit um, stronger. Is that when you're out at a restaurant you can play in a mode where you're passing a single device, right? Mm-hmm. To, and actually play the board game on a, on a smaller platform. And so that was really, really intriguing to, to Calliope. Yeah, and w- the relationship's been great. Granted, Dan is a great designer. Oh, uh, oh God. Dan, did you, did, you, did, you, did you run out of loops for yourself, Dan? Is that why you're not going? Uh, well, well <laughs> actually, Christopher, I do have a little loop like that, but it will take you straight off the board. That's okay. You got to do what you got to do, Dan. <laughs> I don't know. Well, well, I feel that you guys are complaining about me cheating, so I'm going to be nice. I'm not going to play my little loopy one. I'm not going to take Chris off the board, but I am going to place everyone apart from Suzanne in serious jeopardy. Oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay sometimes, sometimes it's more fun not to play to win, but to play to mess with people in this game. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I played the tile that I needed. Let's see here. <laughs> Somebody's going down. Uh, so I've played board games since the 90s. I've, I've loved tabletop and, and analog games for just decades now. And I have a pretty big collection. And Suro's in it. And Suro actually, it's interesting because I tend to like games that are longer and a bit... <laughs> 
take a little bit of time, you know, a few hours and have way more than three to five rolls. But Suro sure. does keep on coming out because it's a, we call it a nightcap game for, for our group, right? It's That's the kind of name. game that oh, you're no. not done with the game night. You don't want to disperse quite yet. You want one more game, but you don't want to go on another three hours. So it's like, well, let's play Suro. All of us, because it's got a high player count, can sit down and it t- you know, there's no setup time. We can relax <laughs> and wind down over a game of Suro. So now I know we call it that because we're really deep into board games and that kind of thing. But I think the other term that we've mentioned already is gateway game, right? Suro yes. feels like a gateway game and it meets all those criteria, Ray, that you talked about of making it approachable for new gamers. So beyond all of those, what are some of your favorite gateway games that you've enjoyed, either that you've published or maybe even ones that you haven't? Uh, so, uh, I'm not, uh, this can go out to, to anybody, any of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so personally, right? Yeah, that's, that's one of the, definitely one of my favorites. But uh, we did a game by Mike Mulvihill a number of years ago. It's actually one of the very first Calliope titles that we did. And um, uh, what? You're thinking about your move? <laughs> <laughs> we lost it. He's like, how am I going to get out of this? What's going on? He just <laughs> realized, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, and Dan is cackling because he knows he has the most loops. So even if everyone yeah, get loops, they collides, no, no, I, I like the idea that. One yet, so. I like the idea, Suzanne, that you're the last one on the board and you just go around and get like 15 loops and Dan can't do anything to stop you That's unless he... Right. That's right. That's right. Unless he goes. Oh, I'm going to make one nice move and Ray takes oh. the second. Oh! Thanks, Ray. Hey. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I love you, man. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, I changed my, my, my favorite gateway game. <laughs> it's, now, it's now Pairs by James Ernest. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a great this game. Is a great game. This yeah. is a phenomenal game. Uh, this so, is uh, uh well guess what so we're both going down <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god oh <laughs> wow, wow. look at this <laughs> all right so, so, well, um, just, so Ray you tell me about your favorite gateway games yeah so Seth Seth Johnson right did it uh, a game for us called Double Double Dominoes, which I absolutely love. It's just a fantastic game. And then um, if I was going to back that up other than roll for it in the other, if I was going to go outside of the Calliope catalog, I would I would say uh, there's a, a game that we did um, a fair many years ago, and I don't even know what it's called, Pack and Stack, right? Pack and Stack. Oh, okay, was, yeah. Yeah. Great, great little game. Lots of fun. Uh, again, it's a three-dimensional game where you have to do a little bit of thinking of uh, what you're doing. But I love the game. Absolutely love it. That's a good one. How about you, Chris? I So I believe that some of my gateway games are ones that everybody knows, but honestly, they did their job with me. So uh, Ticket to Ride and Carcassonne, I think, are probably the games outside of Calliope that I've played with people the most. And then after that, it's probably... A good train game. I do love a good train game. Oh, boy. And that's <laughs> that's one that Ray didn't even tell you, the other gateway game that he loves, which is Station Master. And we got the, we got the rights to make that game. And uh, Ray made a beautiful new version of it that's about to come out. But, um, yeah, I think the other one for me would be Forbidden Island, because Forbidden Island was my oh, first... <laughs> You know, my first foray into cooperative games, and I had never ever had a game like that before. So, you know, I know Pandemic is 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 another one out there, but for me, I've played Forbidden Island with complete, you know, newbies to gaming, and they've absolutely loved it. Yeah, me as well. All right. That's I've one just of my another game, by the way. If you want to like come out and go and uh, come back into a game, uh, this time it's uh, it's the longest path wins. So this Ooh. is a, another like digital mode, uh, which you'd have to be quite dexterous to score in real life. Okay, I feel like this is my game. I feel like I got this one. All right, it's all about the leg. All righty. So anyway, but Dan, you were, you were going to tell me a little bit about... Longest path. 
what does the digital app add on top of the physical version of Sero? So, first of all, one of the most important things uh, when we do a digital edition of a game is that we work out what is what brings that awesome fun to the game, and then we do not mess with it. Right? So, like the, the the natural fun of the game should shine through in the digital edition. But then on top of that, we always try and do something uh, that you can't do uh, in the in the, the standard, I like to say, real world edition, I suppose, or cardboard edition. Um, so we've got uh, AI opponents that you can play. You've got three different uh, levels of AI. You've got AI that will play just to survive. You've got AI that will play to win. And then you've got AI that will play to stop you winning. So uh, that's kind of fun. Obviously, online multiplayer. Uh, and there are two multiplayer modes. So you've seen loot battle, and we're going to play longest part next. But there are also two solo modes. So Chris kind of talked about fuse mode. But fuse mode is an extension of what I call uh, solo mode, where you play with one stone, and you just have to make the longest path possible and the most loops possible. And this actually came from the original demo that we did uh, for for Jordan to kind of pitch to Calliope. Uh, and people kept sending me screenshots of their paths, saying, I've got like 400 meters, beat that. I've got 500, oh, 400 centimeters. I've got 500 centimeters, beat that. And, um, and it was, like for, for something that we just done as a quick demo without all the full function, that's just that basic mode was uh, oddly compelling. So we decided to keep it in as, as a feature because people seem to be having fun with it. And you can compare your score online. And we're running a competition uh, this month, actually, for Sir October. Uh, if you've got the, the mobile edition of this app, you can share your Fuse Mode score on Twitter and the, the highest score every week gets a copy of the game. Or if you already have the good taste to own a copy of Zero. You can have a copy of Sir Seeds. Compliments of Thunderbox. So yeah, do check it out. Uh, but now I'll make my move. And Ray, yeah. Ray, in, a, in, a, in yeah. an extremely cheeky turn of events, has put his stone right next to me, which means he gets free movement. <laughs> in this case, free seven years. <laughs> <laughs> but now, now you're going to uh, have to pay the favor, Raymond. Well, I, and see, that's a very specific move to make, right? So since I, you all, I mean, certainly, Dan, I would assume you are some of the most experienced Suro players in the world. <laughs> what tips do you have for people? Well, I can, I can give you like my tips. I'm, I, to be honest, I'm pretty sure that Ray and Chris have got more experience with this than I have. But I usually try and avoid everybody. <laughs> um, and I, if I can, if I can stay at the center, play with the wrong group, man. Yeah, I've got more, more kind of like possibilities to move around. Great, but if I can't, just avoid everyone. <laughs> well, then get out of my area. <laughs> you <little nut> here. <laughs> That's Ray's fault. He's messing with me. Got it. Chris or Ray, do you have any other big tips on Zero, or is it just? Send a prayer so, up to the gods and hope for the best. You know, so here's the thing about Soro, this game, right? It's actually a game of skill. In, um, and what makes it a game of skill is there's there's 35 tiles um, and 36 positions to play them in. All 35 tiles are unique. So once a tile is actually played, it either closes a door or opens one up. And so if you actually understand what's in front of you, it's kind of like using uh, chess pieces in a, in a chess game. Right, so if you, if in Soro it's territorial, and so understanding how much territory you have and what you can actually do with the tiles that you have in your hand will definitely give you an advantage. So the more you play and the more you understand what the tiles can do for you, the more skill that actually comes into the game. The really nice thing about it is everybody can follow a line, right? So you don't have to have that detailed thinking okay. to actually enjoy. All so, right, Dan, what are you gonna do? Sorry, I was enthralled by Ray's tips. <laughs> <laughs> make a good tips, choice Ray. here, buddy. Make a good choice here. Uh, Don't oh, make see, me I'm mad. Gonna, it's going to be long. It's going to be long. Uh, but you see, if I do this move, I'll, I'll give Suzanne some, some extra path, which I don't want to do too much. So it's got to be this one. <laughs> I mean, I know there's a scenario where you can put a loop in front of me, and I would be very upset. Right. Well, we, we've already ascertained that I'm not that kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll yeah, I'm, see. Putting, I'm putting good karma into the game. That's my that's my top <laughs> tip for winning. Aww. Dan, you mentioned that 
you know, you talked about building an AI and solo mode and all these other features that you did, but you didn't mention VR. What's up with that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we actually were we were approached by Oculus a couple of years ago. Uh, they really liked the app version, sir, and they said, "Have you considered making like a, a VR version for for Gear VR?" And I was like, oh, "Not really. Like my VR, it doesn't sound like it's going to be great." They said, "Well, don't, don't worry. We'll send you a Gear VR so you can try it out. And if you're interested in everything, great. If you're not, whatever." So fine. So he sent me the, the, the Gear VR, and I thought, as he's as he's been kind enough to send me, I'll check it out. It's going to be rubbish. So and I put it put it on, and I was amazed. It was so good. The VR experience you could get just not sticking a phone on your face. So a couple of weeks later, I had a, a, a really bad version of Suro, run it up and running in VR. And uh, oh, it was terrible. It made you sick. And it I thought nasty. you were going to say a couple of weeks later you took the headset off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean like, the lawnmower man at the end of the movie. Your wife's like, take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I don't believe it. Uh, but yeah, uh, so where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, but then like uh, other projects came up, and well, I think two years passed since that. Uh, and and the reason I kind of left it so long is because I. I if I was going to do something in VR with Zero, it had to it had to be unique, it had to be special, it had to bring something to the game. And then I, I went to Oculus Connect uh, when they announced Oculus Quest, and I played super hot, and I was like, oh my god, this is amazing! You can walk around, you can dodge bullets and stuff. It's like, how can I bring that level of fun and immersion to a board game? And, and uh, originally the plan was to have you all sitting around a table, like a lot of those VR board games do, whatever. Um, and I thought, no, I'm going to make the board 70 times bigger than it is in real life. Uh, because Sura is all about space and paths and shapes. So sure, the bigger yeah. it is, the more you can immerse it in there. And it, and, and it becomes a different experience at that scale. And you can actually, if you put it in a, in a Zen garden, you can actually climb the temple buildings to get a better tactical view of the, um, of the game. And then we've hidden game pieces in there so you can unlock new stuff by exploring the garden. You can buy animals, wow. all sorts of stuff like that. So we really wanted to do something that kind of like wraps you, wraps you in the spatial gameplay of Zero. And uh, I'm fairly pleased with it. People seem to like it. It's legit. It's really fun. The, the VR version is, is cool and you can jump from rooftop to rooftop and look uh, down. And... The VR version also available on Steam. And you can get the VR version and this version in a bundle for a discount. Well, what do you know? Yes. Imagine that. <laughs> but really wait, there's really more. Really there's more. Yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll stop being hard style now. But I'm going to pair of shoes. No, I, we, we, um, when I have people play the Suro VR, they're blown away because they're used to Suro has a, a, an elegant simplicity to it. Um, and so does the VR version, but it's much more grand. I mean, there's a, just a scale to it, and it but it still feels zen-like and peaceful, but it, there's more of a grandiose feel to the entire thing. It's just, And then there's little mini things you can do that I'm not going to spoil and things to find, and it's just really, really uh, a fun game to play. And, and, you know, the same, this peaceful music you hear when you play the Steam version, you hear, uh, you know, in the VR, and it's... Uh, I, I can't say enough good things about it. It's a really fun oh. um, implementation well, of. I'm also going to give props to Ray a little bit as well because, um, like, I didn't have to do a lot of convincing to uh, to get him to like to, to get him to allow us to significantly change the zero experience. I was like, Ray, I'm thinking of doing this. It'll look a bit like this. And he goes, Yeah, whatever, Dan. Do what you like. I trust you. <laughs> Oh, that, you need okay. so I, I don't do VR. So what do I need if I wanted to play Sero in VR? What what equipment do I need to have? There is a very long all good VR headsets, including Gear VR, Oculus Go, Oculus Quest, Oculus Rift, and Steam VR. So if you've got any of those, <laughs> you can play. It's almost oh, sorry, sorry, I'll tell you stop with a hard sell. Stop Dan. <laughs> that was extremely, extremely well well said. Like a little bit of practice with that one, I think. Huh? Right? Right? Yeah, I, 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 I wish I practiced it, but it's sinister, in a sinister twist, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> <Just came out>. <laughs> <laughs> well, Zero has been a board game for 15 or longer years now, right? Yeah. It's been around since yeah. 2004. 2004. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. 
That's amazing. And honestly, let's anybody who's familiar with the board game industry knows how few games can stay on the shelf and still be talked about and still be played 15 years after their first release. So I think that that's really highly to Sero's staying power. And, you know, the app, quite frankly, has been out for a long time. I remember when I first covered the app in 2016. You were the best people. You wrote a review on uh, friend, your Friendster review of it was great. Friendster review? <laughs> Come on, man. Oh, jeez. Man, I love what you did on MySpace for it. <laughs> but when we think about longevity, I think Zero, both in digital and in physical form, has really proven its staying power. But what I think is impressive is just like you were talking about the, adding the solo mode or even adding VR, you're continuing to invest in this. And whether it's different takes on the Sero formula with Sero the Seas and Phoenix Rising or whether it's adding new features to the app. So what's what's in the future for Sero? The, the game that's been out there for so long but continues to have legs. Are we seeing yeah. anything with the, the, the physical version or are we seeing anything new in a digital version? Uh, so we, we, we've just done, I think this month, we've had three different versions of Sero uh, published. So we had an update to the mobile app, which had a fused mode. We had the, the Oculus Quest version and this this version, which is available on PC, Mac and uh, Linux as well. Um, and it, it, it has kind of frazzled me a little bit. So we're going to be taking a little break from Sura, but we'll be back. <laughs> be back in the future, no doubt. Fair enough, fair enough. Sura 2000. Yes. Yeah. So on the physical side, on the physical side, we have two different products that are in the in the works right now. Um, it's still going to be a little bit down the road before they come out, but they are very different from what's out there right now. And I think people will be really excited when they when they get them in front of them. So, yeah, it keeps growing. It's right. So I love that. Uh, That's stuff. awesome. Yeah. That's exciting. I'm glad that you're continuing to invest in the Sero line because I think it's been such a rewarding line for players out there to play. Because Damn. when I think about, you know, board game apps that are... Don't do oh. it. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Dan took me I out. Have. Rage quit. <laughs> Finally, I've got my revenge. Yes, you did. You did. Like, I'll, I'll give it to you. Mm. Let's see. Whose turn? Is it Ray's turn? Okay. I'm a little nervous about Dan's turn. Let's see what happens. All the Ray, like that, uh, look of equal length, though. My, actually, my money's on Chris. I had that nice big loop. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, there's still a lot of there's a lot of real estate over there for Ray. Mm. I'll, I'll mm. Some... Oh, I've also just um, I made a tactical blunder on my last go. We'll see well, how this I? goes. We're getting a little snug. Oh, yes. Oh. yes that corner's not feeling so good. <laughs> <laughs> no. Meanwhile, Ray's just over there. Yeah. I know he's Look got at like Ray's smile. He's got miles of daylight in front of him. Uh, yeah, Ray can just mop everyone up afterwards. Okay, I, I, I have another. I, I'm really holding my breath on this move because. <laughs> Make good choices, Dan. So, uh, what, uh, with with this mode specifically, there's there is a slight alteration to the rules that it's um it's kind of hidden. So usually it's illegal in Suro to make a move that will take yourself off the board if you can do another move. Right. Except in fuse mode, uh, in longest path and loop mode, once the deck is out, you can take yourself off the board because a lot of people complained that there was a move they could do that was illegal that would get them a massive score. So yeah. like the, I think in the code somewhere I've, I've described it as blaze of glory rule. Nice. Where you can, you can if you if you can go off with a big score, you can do it in these modes. You know what? It's it, that's the fun should be the paramount thing. That should be the thing that that is above everything else. So that's fantastic. Do, well, I think Ray's know? having fun. Yeah, well, he's oh. yeah, and he'll be having fun <laughs> long after we're dead and buried here. You know, apropos of nothing, do you do you know? the original name of Suro when it was pitched by Tom McMurchie, the designer? I know Ray knows, but do you guys know? Yeah, I don't know, actually. All right, Ray, go ahead. Squiggles. 
squiggles. Was it, was it squiggles <laughs> with, a, with a silent T? I like squiggles. it. <laughs> Squiggle. Squiggle. We had a, a couple of years ago at Gen Con, we actually had a, a glass display case with all of this Suro history stuff, and it had the original Squiggle prototype that was given when the pitch happened and it had like a, a 1950s car with people waving smiley people clip art kind of thing came a long way so where, where really, does the really japanese really aesthetic did. come from what's that, that? Where does the uh, the japanese aesthetic come from i'm assuming it's japanese yeah so um my sister dawn uh and uh, the team at WizKids, right? The creative team at WizKids, uh, which um, was Shane and Kathy Small, right? Um, they actually, with the with the goal of putting the game into uh, bookstores and coffee shops, right, came up with the Sorrel thing, right? So we wanted a much more sophisticated look and. Um, uh, but we wanted it to be very zen like, you know, and I think they did a great job of pulling that together for sure. For sure, yeah. It's super chill. Now drop your it. dang tile in there. Yeah, yeah. This thing up, will you? humiliation, Raymond. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't go on like some lengthy diatribe. <laughs> Let's talk about the colors in the game while you wait for me to win this thing. Well, uh, look how it's flaring and you get the slow mo. Ray wins. Yeah, Ray wins. Shocking. Oh, oh, uh, 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 and, and, and to add insult to the injury, you won using my technique of staying away from everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Your I guess you have a good tip. You had a good trick. Way of winning. <laughs> yeah, I'll take some of the credit for that. That strategy will be in Dan's new book called The Skill of Suro, and yeah. skill is with a T before skill. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Available uh, in a digital form on Steam next month. <laughs> yeah. Are we doing uh, At least we had fun playing, right? Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. That's always the thing. If I had to, if I had to win games to like them, I wouldn't play any games. So, there you go. Yeah, yeah. well, my, my wife would disagree. She thinks that I'm a, a massively sore loser. Uh, but uh, I tell her, like, I, I don't mind losing, but I always play to win. Yeah. Fair and enough. she says, no, that's the game. same thing, Dan. <laughs> well, guys, that was yeah. a lot of fun. Thank you so Thank much you. for yeah, playing. Yeah, really good fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and I really appreciate it. Everybody for watching, we hope that you enjoyed this pretty in-depth look at Suro, the digital version here on the Steam Digital Tabletop Fest. I think Suro is such a phenomenal example of how you can bring the physical into the digital and make it a really rich experience that you can sit around. And, and no better time than now to discover ways that you can play with your friends over a digital format. So. You can, if you don't have Sero yet, you can pick it up right here on Steam. You're welcome to. There's also a mobile app version for iOS and Android if you want to play that way um, as well. Quite frankly, I love it on my mobile app. It's a great game to just chill when you're waiting in line or something like that. So another great implementation there. There's so always Chris, the tabletop version. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and and the tabletop version. That's what I was going to ask. So Ray and Chris, for people who want to know more about Suro, any of the Suro games, or any of the Calliope games, where should they go to check them out? They can go to www.calliopegames.com. Um, they can always stay up. Uh, all of the latest news is on our Twitter feed. So at Calliope Games, we're on Facebook as well. And we're on Instagram with gorgeous pictures of all of these fancy, fancy games. Um, and then your friendly local game store and Amazon. Um, you can pick them up there too. So anywhere you want to play Suro, we've got Suro for you. Whether it's on your computer, we are the, your device, your table, Suro's everywhere. <laughs> yes. And Dan, of course, Thunderbox has other wonderful games on top of Suro. So I'm assuming that they can check those out on Steam. But where can they learn more about what Thunderbox is doing? Well, you guys have already had a, a good old play on The Captain is Dead, which is going to be our next game. Uh, if you the like Captain Suro, is Dead? The Captain what? is Dead, it's, it's a totally, totally different thing. It's literally a now for something completely different. The Captain <laughs> is Dead. So, yeah, that's uh, there's a demo available on Steam. So go check that out. Awesome. 
So thank you everybody for joining us for this playthrough, multiple playthroughs of Suro. Enjoy your digital tabletop fest. Get out there, check out more of the streams, find more of these awesome, awesome tabletop games that have made it into the Steam world for you to play at home. I hope you enjoy them all. And I assure you Thunderbox will be back with more content for their games very, very soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Yes.